good afternoon. Nice to see you all here. I think it's been quite a while since I've spoken at a science conference. In fact, I can't really remember the last time I've ever done this. And so I guess I should thank, uh, thank the organizers for allowing people like me to, to be a part of this. I've really enjoyed the day so far, let me tell you. Enjoyed all the sessions that I've been, been to and uh, really appreciate them. Our, um, this morning, what I, would, this afternoon, what I would like to do is explore the question of whether a commitment to naturalism is both necessary for legitimate scientific inquiry and at the same time in conflict with historic Christian belief. See so what I'm getting out there? Are, is it, is it, are both those true? The view that it is, well, let me just say that one more time, explore the question of whether a commitment to naturalism is both necessary for legitimate scientific inquiry and at the same time in conflict with historic Christian belief. Okay? The view that it is has moved some to turn away from Christianity and embrace atheism instead. On this view, the move to atheism clears the way to adopt naturalism and thus gain the freedom to carry out legitimate scientific inquiry. That's what moved me into this issue, is when I began reading of certain people doing that and laying out their, their arguments for it. The question of naturalism has been highly significant for really for a few different groups of people. One group is people involved in science. Another group is those involved in interpreting the New Testament. You can see how, how influential it would be for that. Uh, and of course, people involved in a variety of apologetic questions. Naturalism has been really relevant for people like that as well. People, and that's, that's where I spent quite a bit of my time in the last number of years. I think it's safe to say that the importance of our background views for interpreting the world can hardly be overstated. Uh, our assumptions really do determine the way we interpret our experiences and the documents we read. As C.S. Lewis put it, and I think this is a quite, quite a, a uh, telling way to, to put it, what we learn from experience depends on the kind of philosophy we bring to experience. This fact was brought home to me with striking force one day a number of years back. I was listening to the radio with CBC and I heard evangelist turned agnostic Charles Templeton being interviewed by a CBC interviewer. Uh, and and the, the interviewer had heard of an event that happened to Templeton a number of years before when he actually witnessed a miracle. And so he, he wanted Templeton to talk about this. And so Templeton began relating this personal experience in this interview. And, and uh, he explained that in his earlier years as a Christian minister, he had been asked to pray for the healing of a young girl who had a physical deformity. He went to the home, he did so, and the, 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 the little girl had a deformity which had her head go off to the side and a couple of other things as well. He went to the home and he did so. And when he looked up from his prayer, he and, he and the mother looked up from the prayer, the deformity was gone. The, mother, the child's mother, who was present, fainted on the spot. And the, the incredulous interviewer asked Templeton, how, you can, how, how can, you, can you leave this faith after witnessing something so dramatic and so clear? And I thought his answer, and I was wondering the very same thing, so I was listening to the interview. His answer was really telling to me. He said, I don't really know what happened there. Perhaps it was a mysterious psychosomatic event, remember that word, or even something entirely different, unexplainable, I don't know. He said, in any event, he went on to say he didn't view this as a miracle since he no longer believed in the supernatural realm or in the existence of a God behind it. In other words, the point is, as an agnostic, with no remaining belief in the supernatural realm, his only option was to deny that a miracle occurred, even one that happened this vividly right before his eyes. I've heard of other cases a little bit like that, but that always stands out in my mind as the, as the most dramatic. And the point I learned from that is any alternative explanation, however unusual, or we might say, however implausible, was preferable, because, because there simply was no room for that miracle. Now, here's what's interesting to me about that. As astonishing as that may sound, I have found that even people who are open to the supernatural, probably like most of us in this room, can probably relate to it in, in an ironic sort of way. If you are such a person, ask yourself this, how you or most of your friends, or even I myself, how would we respond to a neighbor who tells you that she heard a ghost in her basement last night? In fact, says the neighbor, every two weeks the ghost makes its appearance, giving off the same guttural noise of, oh yes, it's a ghost for sure. We've checked out every possible alternative explanation. We've checked the windows. We've checked the plumbing. We've checked the chimney, etc. And none explains the eerie sounds. How would you react? That's an illustration that comes from a different author that I've, I've read. Uh, I've changed it just a tiny bit, but that's uh, one put forward by him. And, and what I found is, most people I know would probably laugh off in this explanation of a ghost with comments like, well, I don't really know what you keep hearing there, but I can tell you this much, it's not a ghost. 
Okay? Now, what's interesting to me about that is that most of us would probably continue to insist on this even in the absence of any better alternative explanation. In other words, it's not because the evidence tells us it's not a ghost. In fact, we haven't even got a better explanation. Rather, our background belief that ghosts do not exist is determining our response, is driving our response. We simply have no intellectual space for that ghost. And in the same way, the naturalist believes nature is all there is, and therefore miracles simply do not happen. They will often maintain their position, even in the absence of a better alternative explanation. Sometimes that's frustrating, but I, I, I see that happening. Interestingly enough, when it comes to judging the reliability of the New Testament, for example, it's an interesting side case here. People like R.G. Swinburne, who looked into this in great detail, theologian, philosopher, uh, English, and R.G. France, who's no longer with us, believe that the most foundational reason many people judge the New Testament, New Testament to be unreliable has nothing to do with trustworthiness as a historical document, but rather concerns the presence of miracles and the supernatural in it. Swinburne actually goes so far as to say this, there is in my view, this is a quote from Swinburne now, there is in my view, so much testimony to the main outlines of the traditional account of the, of the Gospels, that if this, if this event was of a kind which we might okay, occasionally expect to happen, in other words, if it didn't contain the supernatural, we would have no problem in accepting the main point of that testimony. So in other words, it's the presence of the supernatural that's a stumbling block, not of anything else, and that drives people not to accept the New Testament as a reliable document. Now, having said all that, in my view, there is really nothing wrong with being cautious when encountering supernatural claims. My observation is that most of us really are quite cautious in that regard, and I, and I can't see anything wrong with it. Christian philosopher Jerry Habermas, some of you may have read his stuff, he has an interesting comment here. He notes that it generally is a quote from him, a generally trustworthy text, whatever that may be, New Testament or any other text that's generally trustworthy, does not guarantee the truth of all its details. He says, and this is especially true, he adds, when the book contains, a super, contains supernatural claims. Our best libraries, Habermas goes on to say, contain many generally reliable books with which we are willing to disagree on this point or that point. And some of those points are precisely the supernatural elements, and he brings out a few of those. So with that as background here, let's turn to the, this question that we want to get into today a little more. The question of whether a commitment to naturalism is both necessary for legitimate scientific inquiry, and at the same time, is it in conflict with historic Christian belief? Actually, two questions here. Is a commitment to naturalism necessary for proper scientific study? That's question one. And question two is, is naturalism in conflict with historic Christian belief? I say historic. Uh, I mean, the, the Christian belief that's been with us for 2,000 years. I, I, let me say something about both those questions. First of all, a key distinction has to be made. There's actually at least two forms of naturalism. And so I think it's important to recognize that naturalism comes in at least these two forms. And as odd as it may sound, some naturalists will have an openness to the supernatural. It all depends on what kind of naturalist you are. The first one I want to mention here it's called philosophical naturalism, sometimes called metaphysical naturalism, probably heard that term maybe, sometimes even ontological naturalism, but the usual term for it, philosophical naturalism, PN is sometimes put in different documents. Philosophical naturalism is the assumption that there is no supernatural realm, that nature is all there is. Therefore, miracles cannot and will not occur. In my experience, at least, this seems to be the kind of naturalism many people have in mind when they use the term naturalism. If you just throw the term out there, that's probably what you're thinking. The point is that if, the point I like to make here is that if, if philosophical naturalism is true, then there could be no miracle, since there would be no supernatural realm. Thus, no supernatural being out there who might, from time to time, choose to intervene in our world and bring about a miracle. Philosophical naturalism, then, is logically incompatible with any worldview which includes the possibility of the supernatural. So before we evaluate it, let me make a couple of observations about it, about philosophical naturalism. The, the first one I think is important to remember is that, and this is something maybe we're all already thinking about here, but I want to point it out, is that philosophical naturalism is not an argument per se. It's not an argument. It's actually just an assumption, right? Maybe I shouldn't say just an assumption. It is an assumption, a starting point about the way the world is which certain people then bring to their life experiences, including the reports of miraculous events that year. You bring this assumption to those reports, 
In other words, it's a starting point in the thinking of certain people, which they bring to any issue they discuss. That's what philosophical naturalism is, an assumption or a starting point. Now, this is not in any way to demean or diminish its influence. On the contrary, as we noted a little bit earlier, our foundational assumptions are immensely powerful in guiding how, in determining how we interpret our surroundings and the reports we hear from others. Like any assumption or any starting point, philosophical naturalism excludes certain ideas from the realm of live options a person is willing to consider. As an assumption, however, it's also open to the question of why we should begin with it, rather than the opposite assumption, namely that the supernatural is possible. It's at least open to that question. So we'll come to that a, a, little, a little bit shortly. The second observation is this, that as liberating as some appear to think philosophical naturalism is, because it supposedly sheds all religious restrictions on one's thinking, it actually brings with it its own set of restrictions. All, uh, 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 we've, uh, and, and we've already noted above uh, that philosophical naturalism rules out in advance the possibility of anything miraculous or supernatural. Already noted that. But what some may not have noticed here are the significant restrictions this assumption then places on the way the naturalist must now sit through evidence. For example, philosophical naturalists are not even free to, to, to even consider the possibility that a miracle has occurred regardless of where the evidence points. They simply cannot go there, as in the case of Templeton, at least not so long as they want to remain philosophical naturalists. It's simply not a live option, since their worldview rules out the notion of miracles. I often ask students, how hard would you look for something that you know is not there? You don't look very hard for it because you know it's not there. This is an interesting point. It is really not a new one. I read it a, a number of years back in G.K. Chesterton, who, who wrote way back in 1908. He asked why the naturalist, or he called him the material, the strict materialist, Turner he asked why this person always disbelieves the report of any miracle. Why? Why does he always disbelieve everyone? He, and and Chef Chester went on to say, it's not because his viewpoint allowed him to deny it, or deny these reports. Rather, he says, he disbelieves miracles because his, his very strict materialism does not permit him to believe them. In other words, there is a restriction on the thinking there, and he is not permitted to go there. Now, however, uh, restrictive or not, we need to ask whether there are good reasons to embrace philosophical naturalism. It's, it's very it's very widespread in our culture. Um, and then my next little heading is called Philosophical Naturalism's Intrinsic Weakness. Given how widespread this is in our Western culture today, we should ask whether it is a defensible starting point. Is it an assumption we should all embrace? That's the question I'd like to put to us right now. Uh, and very briefly, just let me say, unfortunately, Philosophical naturalism, as an assumption, has a serious intrinsic weakness right off the top. And Richard Swinburne, who I mentioned earlier, explains it this way. Let me give you one more little quotation from him. He says this, Since it is at least logically possible that the way things behave depends on God or some other supernatural agent, and he could alter this on an isolated occasion while conserving the normal way things behave on other occasions, since all that's at least logically possible, we need a looser conception of a law of nature so as not to rule out in advance that logical possibility. So he has this. That allows the logical possibility of what he calls a transgression, or he says, or as I shall call it, a violation of a law of nature, which will inevitably be by a particular volition of the deity. Now, of course, not everyone will define a miracle as a violation of a law of nature. But Swinburne's insight here, I think, is, is really quite interesting. It's this, that as so long as the existence of God or some other supernatural agent is even logically possible, miracles are also possible. Since if there is a God, he could cause one if he chose to. This means that miraculous explanations for events, though, can be ruled out only if one has an airtight argument for atheism one which would somehow show that the existence of God is not even logically possible. Because if God is even logically possible, then miracles are also at least possible. Notice how C.S. Lewis makes a similar point corresponding with the statement that we, uh, that we mentioned earlier about the philosophy we bring to experience. This is in his book, Miracles. He says this, If we decide that nature is not the only thing there is, then we cannot say in advance whether she is safe from miracles or not. And then Lewis says this, 
after accepting the possibility that God invents and acts, there can be no ground for assuming in advance that he does not do miracles. Now, taking Lewis and Swinburne together, notice the relationship between their two comments here. Lewis' point is, I think, pretty obvious. If God exists, miracles are possible. Since it would be up to God whether he would choose to intervene into the affairs of the world or cause a miracle. Such a thing can't be ruled out in advance. But that means, though, however, that as Swinburne noted, if the existence of God is even possible, and this is what I find interesting, if the existence of God is even possible, then miracles are also, at the very least, possible. Again, this means miraculous explanations cannot be ruled out in advance. Now, what all this means to me is that, as stated above, the only way to prove that philosophical naturalism is a defensible perspective or starting point or assumption is to have an airtight argument for atheism. But what argument is that? Atheism is the belief that God does not exist. But perhaps we need to be a little more precise here. The claim is that God does not exist where? Anywhere, in or out of the universe. It's an exceedingly large claim, one which logicians call a universal negative. And as it turns out, this claim is extremely difficult to defend since it entails the notion that there is no supernatural being not only within our universe, but also beyond it as well, beyond the things science observes, who might choose to intervene in the affairs of the world from time to time. How could any human being ever know such a thing to be true, or even be likely? Um, to, to do that, one would need to have far greater knowledge than any of, than any of us has, perhaps even need to be omniscient. Let me switch, though, so much for philosophical naturalism. What about the other form I want to bring up today, and that is called methodological naturalism. Methodological naturalism. This is an interesting term I find different things said about this among the Christian community and among even the Christian philosophical community. It's a term thought to have been invented by Paul de Vries. It was introduced in a paper presented by him in 1983. The paper was called Naturalism and the Natural Sciences, Paul de Vries. He was at that time a professor at Wheaton College. He's currently the president of New York Divinity School. It's since become an established term, methodological naturalism which describes a method of doing science. We'll call it MN versus, as opposed to PN, as we're talking about before. MN, methodological naturalism, is the assumption that, is how DeVries put it and others have since, that natural events have natural causes. And then it moves from there to investigate those causes. But as such, it says nothing about the existence of God or the possibility of miracles. See what I'm saying here? So it's, it's the assumption the natural events are there, they have natural causes, and then it moves from there to investigate those causes, but it says nothing about whether there may be a God there or the possibility of miracles standing behind it. Some methodological naturalists will believe there is a God or some other supernatural being behind all so-called natural events, while others will not. But both may work side by side in the lab investigating their natural causes. Now, it's quite clear that philosophical naturalism is incompatible with Christianity. That's why some people move away from Christianity so they can, they can embrace it. But what about methodological naturalism? Is a Christian compelled to reject this form as well? This is, in my mind, a really important question. It's hard to deny that at the very least, Christianity's view of the world is compatible with scientific inquiry, which seeks to understand the lawful, stable structure of the universe. Christianity, in fact, presents a view of God and of the world and of the universe, which is compatible with, and in fact, I go further, which in fact provides for it having a lawful, stable structure, which functions according to consistent natural laws. In this environment, predictions are possible, as is the study of natural events and the causes. Now, if this kind of inquiry is what is meant by methodological naturalism, then it's hard for me to see why a Christian or anybody else whose worldview contains a supernatural element should take issue with it. In fact, most Christians seem to happily operate on the basis of it in their day-to-day -day decisions, I find. When their children have seizures, or a fever, or pneumonia, most Christians make trips to the doctor to search for natural causes and for treatments of the malady, just as their philosophical naturalist friends and neighbors may do. It's only when MN, methodological naturalism, is joined with certain other beliefs that it becomes incompatible with Christianity. For example, the belief that there is no God, or there is no supernatural realm, or that science is the only source of truth about the way the universe functions. Uh, so long as it's not joined with any, with any of those beliefs, however, it appears to me to be compatible with belief in a transcendent God, 
who stands behind everything that happens in nature, and who could, at the times of his choosing, intervene into human affairs and cause a miracle. In fact, here, here's what I see. I see many Christians fervently praying to God, sometimes even asking for a miracle, even while on their way to the doctor with a sick child. Now, we should really be quite clear what's happening when that's going on. By going to the doctor, they are demonstrating their belief that so-called natural causes can be found for events such as their child's illness. And they're placing trust in the scientist, their physician, to be able to discover those causes and to suggest a remedy. By praying in the car on the way to the doctor, not texting or phoning, but praying is still permissible, okay? By praying, and maybe even asking God for a miracle while they're in the car on the way to the doctor, they're acting on their belief that God is behind all so-called natural events, and that he could intervene and can at the, at the times of his choosing. It seems to me, then, that this kind of naturalism, uh, methodological naturalism, presents no threat to the belief that God can and sometimes does act in miraculous ways, or that a person who believes this can participate in the scientific inquiry. Thank you very much. Okay, we have about five minutes for questions. If you can speak up, since... Uh... Sure. There's one right over here. Yes, go ahead. Sorry, could you repeat the definition of methodological naturalism? Methodological naturalism? I'm saying it's the assumption that says that there are natural events, and they have natural causes, but as such it says nothing about whether there's a God or a supernatural realm also in existence, who could from time to time choose to intervene. So, so when you say, uh, see, I just feel it usually not as a yeah. metaphysical claim, but as a, a way of approaching the world, and sort of an assumption that we're always going to look for natural causes, right. even recognizing that theoretically they might not exist. Okay, you know that? Um, well, they, 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 yeah, I, I'm not sure that it has to, you have to assume that they will for sure exist them, and that we're going to find them. I'm not sure we have to even assume that. But it says, it says it looks at things that happen in the world, it says that we're going to call these natural events. They have natural causes because the universe and the world work according to natural laws. And we're going to search for those. Yeah. But as a method, it says nothing about whether there is a God or a supernatural element back behind it. Right. So in other words, some, some people who do this would, might believe that, and some of this might not. I'm not sure if I'm still not getting so, yeah, it's, it's a commitment to look for natural causes. Yes. Even when maybe it seems hard, we continue to sure. do that. Right, exactly. Yeah, that's a good point. That's good. Your contrast is between materialism as airtight and materialism with some holes in it. Is it possible to go beyond that to a larger paradigm that is capable of including both the material and the non-material in a way that both can be investigated? You mean, are you going to be thinking natural, the natural and non-natural? Yes. That's what you mean, yeah, that, that both can be investigated? Yes. I see, I see no problem doing that. I, I think that's perfectly possible. Sure. I don't, I don't think there's any problem with that at all. I, I, I think probably people who are in science, once they get to the non-natural, they're going to be calling that something different. Uh, they might call it theology or something like that. I'm not sure. But, but to, to investigate those and see, that's what's important for the Christian. There, uh, it seems to me. The Christian says, we're investigating natural causes, but we believe there's another whole realm out there, which we want to know about. If there's any other way to know about that realm, we want to know about that too. And, and, that, and that's part of the Christian's overall analysis planting with all the overall evidence base, is bigger than just what we call natural causes. But we're still perfectly willing to look for natural causes from natural events. So I think I got your question. Yeah, it's an interesting one. Okay. I think I have a question behind me here, too. Okay. Yeah. Do you want me to go first? You go. You go. Okay. Uh, so I guess I, you talked about uh, philosophical naturalism being restrictive. Um, yeah. So I wonder uh, what say Hume's argument of, of probability with miracles, you right. know, the, the probability that this person is lying. Right. Does that simply give them the appearance of tearing down those walls, these probabilistic arguments, or does it truly uh, provide for some degree of objectivity in dealing with uh, these miraculous claims? Yeah, no, I, I don't think, I, I think his, his advice is, is not bad if you just take it as advice. If you take it as an airtight argument against miracles, which is what he does, it's kind of funny the way he puts it. He kind of pats himself on the back because I, I take great pleasure in knowing that I have come up with this argument that now once and for all settles the case of, again, the miracles. Uh, it, it goes way too far. It proves way too much. 
Uh, I, I actually prefer John Stuart Mill, as, as some of his friends have a great response to that. Which I think that they said, if you just take Hume's method, we're going to be ruling out many, many things which we have good reason to have happened. They're just going to be ruled out because they're unusual or for some other reason. John Stuart Mill's question was, we should, we, so we should be asking this question. What are the chances that if the event did not happen, these witnesses would still be saying that it did? Ask that question. That's a question he didn't ask. But as far as, as, far as uh, being careful with how we evaluate reports of miracles, I think we should be very careful. And you know what? In, this, in our culture today, we probably are quite careful. I bet most of us in here are what, uh, what we might call closet naturalists. If someone came to us with a miracle record, we would probably exhaust every naturalist option before accepting that a miracle occurred. But at least we probably would be open to the idea that a miracle might have occurred. That's, uh, that's good. Now, do you have time for your comment? Moderate against the last question. Yeah. Um, it's still along the same lines. Uh, theologians are mostly moving away from the term natural, supernatural. Um, so I'm wondering if what you think in terms of material, non-material, there is a lot of uh, scientific evidence uh, for unseen realities. I'm thinking quantum physics, I'm thinking some of the parapsychology and NDE kind of stuff. Yeah. Just wondering what impact that would have on the naturalism issue. Well, yeah, that, that, that's, that's probably an issue of terminology, and, and I, I was you know, working with another group of scientists one, uh, one event I was at, and I saw the whole room full of them, they were all saying that many of them were Christians, and they were saying, we don't really prefer this distinction between naturalism and supernatural, because we, we think that behind the whole thing is a God who's behind all so-called natural laws. Well, I actually appreciate that. I, I, I'm just using terminology that seems to be out there to distinguish a miracle from something that happens according to lawful, stable structure. Uh, but, but uh, yeah, the, the terminology will, I'm sure, continue to change, and we have to keep up with it.